Hello! It is Tuesday and we are continuing to read the Saturdays for our chapter book story time here at the Caribou Public Library. Um, we are on chapter four and chapter four is quite a lengthy chapter so I am thinking we may end up splitting it into two sections today. Um, we'll see how it goes but we don't want it to be too long for the videos as far as uploading and all that. It takes a long time. So we'll see how this goes, all right? So chapter four is called Saturday Four, right? I wonder whose Saturday it is this time. All right, Randy sat on her bed, watching Mona get ready to go. Lunch was over and the dishes were washed, but a faint odor of baked potatoes and lamb chops lingered comfortably in the house. Mona's side of the room was covered with photographs of actors and actresses, some signed and some just cut out of magazines and thumbtacked to the wall. The most precious ones were framed and stood on her bureau with her brush and comb set, two artificial roses in a vase, and a bottle of perfume called Night on the Nile, which had never been opened. It was all very tidy and correct. The only thing about Mona's side of the room which led you to suppose that she wasn't a young lady was her bed. It was very flat, she never used a pillow, and at the head of it sat a giant panda made out of plush and an ancient cloth doll named Marilyn, whose face had entirely disappeared. The sunlight came into the room, and so did weaving branch shadows from elanthus trees in the backyard. Mona was brushing her hair. Electricity made it stand out in a silken skein that Randy could hear it crackle like burning leaves. It was almost too bright to look at in the sun. You have beautiful hair, she said. Oh, beautiful, scoffed Mona, brushing as if she hated it. Nasty old straight stuff. You and Rush are the lucky ones. Rush doesn't think so. He's always trying to make his, his lie down and be straight. Remember the time he put the gelatin on it? They both laughed. Mona's fingers deftly plated, plated her golden hair. Then she put on her cleanest sweater and skirt and her green coat and hat that matched. But where were her gloves? She jerked open the bureau drawers, borrowing, burrowing through them until they boiled over. Not a glove in sight. Randy got off her bed and joined the search, and at last they were located in the strangest places. One in the kitchen beside the alarm clock, and one upstairs in the office on the piano. All my gloves behave like that, said Mona, slapping them together as if to punish them. They never want to stay in pairs. They're what the newspaper, newspapers call incompatible, said Rush. What are you going to do with your afternoon? Come on, Mona, be a sport. But Mona wouldn't tell. She patted her pocketbook and smiled mysteriously. The truth was, she wasn't sure herself. Goodbye, kids, she said. Parting is such sweet sorrow. Scram, advised Rush, holding the door open for her. When she had gone down the front steps, he and Randy tormented her all the way up the block by yelling admonitions after her at the top of their wicked, wicked lungs. Don't get run over. Don't get lost. Don't talk to strangers. I suppose I might as well practice, said Rush, slowly climbing the stairs. Later, we can go to the park. Isaac trotted at his heels. Do you remember who Isaac is? The puppy that Rush found in the last chapter. Yep. Four, though Rush had honorably inspected all of the lost notices in the newspapers for the past week, he had found no description of a lost dog resembling Isaac. Poodles, yes. Dachshund and Sillyhams and Scotties, yes. But not, thank heaven, a single mention of a single of a small intelligent mongrel who showed traces of spaniel ancestry. So Randy followed them. She was going to play drugstore with Oliver on the top floor bathroom. It was really an advanced form of mud pies. You took all the leftover toothpaste, cold cream, talcum powder, and medicines that had been hanging about the medicine cabinets long enough not to be missed, and you made mixtures. Last time they had evolved two splendid creations. Measles snot, a cure for measles made out of talcum powder, cold cream, and a dash of turtle food. Hmm. A complexion jellyfish, which is a skin remedy compounded of melted soap and pink mouthwash. Soon Randy and Oliver were happily and messily absorbed, and except for the music that poured out of the office, the house was very still. Mona walked along the street, feeling like the heroine of a play. The whole afternoon lay ahead of her, filled with boundless opportunities. It was a cold day, but not too cold. Mona couldn't remember when the air had ever seemed so delicious before. She felt like running or soaring in great bounding leaps or shouting noisily, but naturally she did nothing of the kind. She walked sedately along the street, swinging her pocketbook and smiling to herself. 
She wondered if the people who passed her noticed the smile and thought to themselves, who can she be? What a strange, mysterious smile. But then, it always happened that way, she caught sight of her reflection in the glass shop window and was astonished at how much fatter and shorter she was than she, than she thought of herself as being. Between the swinging braids, her round face with this mysterious smile looked perfectly sappy. There was no other word for it, just sappy. Minus the smile, but still happy, she turned the corner to Fifth Avenue. It was full of Saturday afternoon crowds of people who had finished their work and eaten their lunch, and now were busy shopping or amusing themselves. The air was filled with a big slapping, shining wind, and Mona saw two people chasing after their hats. She waited on the corner until a bus bumbled to a stop in front of her, and jumping aboard, she ran up the narrow steps to the upper deck and found a seat. The wind was terrific. It made her eyes water and her nose run. The man in the seat ahead was smoking a cigar, and great billows of strong smoke blew straight into her face. But it didn't matter. She enjoyed it all. The sidewalk was a river of people. The street was a torrent of traffic. On each side of the towering buildings were studded, were studded with as many windows as there are stars in heaven. And high, high overhead against the cold blue sky, a tiny airplane flashing like a dagger wrote a single magic word, Pepsi-Cola in mile-long loops of smoke. At 44th Street, Mona pushed the little bell in the railing, climbed over the lap of the stout lady who had sat down beside her, and made a perilous descent to the street. Across the avenue, then two blocks west, and she was on Broadway. Mona had never been there by herself before, and it was wonderful. For a while, she simply drifted up with the crowds up one side of the famous thoroughfare and down the other. There was a lot to see, and she saw most of it. She studied the pictures in front of the dazzling movie theater where a doorman in gold braid was bellowing haughtily, standing room only, <clears throat> standing room only. She spent an absorbed 10 minutes before the donut palace watching a business-like machine creating tens of dozens of donuts to be devoured by tens of dozens of hungry people. In another machine displayed in a drugstore, popcorn was bouncing frivolously. The whole block smelled of it. Every place there were things to eat. In one restaurant window, a cook in a tall white cap was lifting great hanks of spaghetti out of a vat. And in another one, farther along, a big black woman in a green apron was flying hamburg frying hamburgers on a copper plate. Open air stands on the corner were selling drinks made out of every kind of fruit you can think of. Orange and pineapple and banana and coconut and papaya. But Mona was too excited to be hungry. She just drifted along looking and listening and smelling. There was a lot of noise, a huge sound of voices and footsteps, commotion of honks and hoots from the traffic, policemen's whistles, a noise of things going on. Past 50th Street, another window caught her attention. In it, there was nothing but a lot of draped pink silk and three wax ladies' heads mounted on stands. Each of the ladies was smiling the same sweet, stupid smile, and each was wearing an elaborate wig. One was blonde, one was red, and one, for some reason, was lavender. On the glass in gold letters was written, Etienne and Howard, or excuse me, Etienne and Edward, hairdressers and beauty specialists. Three items, one dollar. Mona's heart beat fast, and suddenly she knew what she was going to do. After all, nobody ever asked me not to, she told herself, and I never promised I wouldn't. But all the time she knew that she was quibbling, the corner of her mind that never let itself be fooled was well aware that neither father nor Cuffy would approve of what she was about to do. But nothing could stop her now, and pushing open the heavy glass door, she went into the shop. It was a busy place. People in white uniforms hurried to and fro, carrying combs, scissors, bowls of hairpins. Everyone was talking. The place smelled of hot hair and perfume. At one side of the room sat a long row of ladies, each with her head bowed meekly under the buzzing bell-shaped metal thing. They made Mona think of the old nursery rhyme. Mary, Mary, quite contrary, how does your garden grow with cockle shells and silver bells and pretty maids all in a row? Only very few of these ladies were pretty. Yes, dear, inquired a voice sweetly. There was a blonde lady enthroned at a raised desk. She had a round chalk white face with nothing in it except eyes, nose and mouth. No wrinkles, no expression, no smile. It reminded Mona of the Tang goddess from China that father had in his study at home. Even the, ha the lady's hair was like the goddess's headdress. It was all built up on her head in silvery golden curls and spirals. 
It must be done with glue, thought Mona. I don't see how it could stay up that way otherwise. Or maybe she uses gelatin like Rush. She had to smile at the thought. Yes, dear, repeated the voice, this time a little more sharply. Is there something I can do for you? Mona flapped her braids nervously. My hair, she said. I want it cut off. <laughs> the goddess never batted an eyelash. She simply turned her head and called out in a voice like an iron file. Oh, Mr. Edward, she called. Oh, Miss Pearl. Mr. Edward was tall and refined looking, with wavy dark hair and melancholy eyes, like a poet. Miss Pearl was small and pretty, with a smile that never left her face for an instant. She talked through it and ate through it, and it was probably still there when she was asleep. <laughs> this little girl would like her hair bobbed, explained the goddess. Those lovely braids, exclaimed Miss Pearl. Yes, said Mona firmly. I loathe them. She's quite right, too, agreed Mr. Edwards. She stood away. He stood away and regarded her through narrow eyes, more like a painter than a poet. The little lady is definitely the sub, sub did, <laughs> the subbed type. I see a long bob, about shoulder length, fluffy, soft, youthful. He looked like a man in a trance. Well, we'll take her to the booth 11 then, said the goddess practically. Etienne's permanent wave just went home a couple minutes ago, so it's empty. Booth 11 was hung on three sides with silky green curtains, like a little tent. On the fourth side, there was a large mirror and a basin all grinning and glittering with faucets and gadgets. Miss Pearl hung up Mona's hat and coat, draped her with a pink rubber cape, told her to sit down on the important looking chair in front of the basin and began undoing her braids. Such beautiful hair, honey, said Miss Pearl. Seems like it's almost a shame to cut it off. What'll your mama say? My mother is dead, said Mona. Oh, oh, oh well. It sure is lovely hair though. So long too. Way down to your hips almost. Are you sure you want to bob it? Absolutely positive, replied Mona. Well, okay then. Oh, Mr. Edward, bleated Miss Pearl over her shoulder. And Mr. Edward appeared suddenly, dramatically from behind the curtain with a flashing smile like the villain in a play. Iago, thought Mona to herself. He clicked the scissors together hungrily then he began. Mona discovered that her heart was beating fast again. Shining strands fell to the floor into Mona's lap. Everywhere in the mirror she could see her anxious face framed between a long lock on one side and a sort of ragged clump like a cocker spaniel's ear on the other. As he worked Mr. Edward asked all the usual dull boring questions that Mona felt she should have outgrown long ago. Questions like what is your name little lady? How old are you? What school do you go to? Do you enjoy it? What class do you enjoy most? I bet you enjoy recess most, don't you? Have you any brothers or sisters? My, my, isn't that nice? How old are they? And what are their names? Etc. Goodness, the questions children always had to answer, and politely, too. Still, she, he seemed to be a nice man, and Mona had the feeling that he was really just as bored as she was by the questions and only asking to be kind. Oh dear, cried Mona in consternation, looking at the horrible reflection of herself in the mirror. She saw a frightened face framed by a lot of straight bushy hair lopped off at the shoulders. Oh, Mr. Edward, I look like an old English thatched cottage. I don't like it. Now, now, never mind, he consoled her. You just wait until we get finished. It won't look anything like this, I promise. Now, let's see. Mona could tell that he was racking his brains for another question to ask her. Ah, he had it. And what are you going to do when you grow up, little lady? Mona wished he wouldn't call her little lady, but aloud she answered politely. An actress, she said. Well, said Mr. Edward, mildly surprised. Isn't that cute, exclaimed Miss Pearl, to Mona's boundless disgust. A movie actress. No, said Mona proudly, a real actress on the stage, like Helen Hayes or Ethel Barrymore. Well, if that's the case, we must make you as handsome as we can, mustn't we? said Mr. Edward. All right, Pearl, you can take over now. Goodbye, Myrna. Mona saw that he hadn't understood her name. Just you relax and I'll be back in a flash. Miss Pearl twirled the chair around and fastened a sort of metal plate to the back of it. At one end of the plate, there was a curved dent that looked as though someone had taken a bite out of it. Now rest your neck in there, honey, said Miss Pearl and lay your head back. That's right. Cascades of warm water and foaming suds of perfumed soap flowed over Mona's scalp. 
Miss Pearl's fingers were light and dexterous. This was something entirely different from Cuffy's brand of shampoo. Cuffy scrubbed as if her hope of salvation depended upon it. When she was through, your eyes were red and smarting from all the soap that had gotten into them, and your whole skull was throbbing, as though it had been beaten with a mallet. The Melody children dreaded shampoo days as they dreaded few things, and Oliver had once been heard begging Cuffy to use the vacuum cleaner on his scalp instead. I've used, I used to have a couple of pigtails, too, when I was about your age, remarked Miss Pearl. I'll never forget the first time it was cut. She laughed reminiscently. My brother cut it for me. Your brother? Yes, my brother, the time we ran away. The time you ran away from home? Oh, if you could call it home. It's kind of like in the fairy stories. My mother died when I was a baby and a long time afterward, my mother, my father married again, but he only lived a year after that. Then there, were, there we were with a stepmother, a wicked stepmother, just like in the fairy stories. Was she really wicked? She surely was. She was a mean one. Not so much to Perry, that's my brother, because he was two years older than me, and you know how boys are, kind of strong and tough. My father had bought a new house when he married her, and my, how we hated it. It was a farm way outside of town. A little place called Verona was where we came from. And the house was kind of high and thin, made out of brick, and it had trees all around. Those big, sad black evergreens. I don't know what you call them. My, I wish, or I can make myself blue just remembering how the wind used to sound in the branches of those darn trees. You can sit up now, dear. We're all finished. Miss Pearl twirled the chair back again, and Mona looked at her drippy reflection without seeing it. But, Miss Pearl, tell me how you ran away. Well, we finally, I, I just couldn't stand it anymore. She used to beat me up something terrible, and she kept us working all day long. She wouldn't let us go to school, even. Well, one afternoon she caught me reading a book when I was supposed to be mending. So she took the book and threw it in the stove and then she whipped me good. It was just too much. I sneaked out to the barn where Perry was milking and I says to him, I won't stay any longer. I'm gonna run away to an orphan asylum. So Perry says, I'll go with you. He was all excited. Not to an orphan asylum though, he said. We'll go to the city and make our fortunes. Well, I have to laugh when I think of it. Miss Pearl was drying Mona's hair dreamily. We didn't make our fortunes exactly, but we made out all right. But tell me about the running away. Oh, well, we got it all planned out. I had a heifer that was my very own. I raised her from a calf. Margaret, her name was. Perry had a sow called Greta. That was his own. Besides that, he had a good bicycle and dad's gold watch. We never took a single thing that belonged to our stepmother. Well, so the day before we left, I sneaked away and walked Margaret all the way to Verona, near five miles. I sold her, too. She felt bad about it, but I had to do it. She was a good heifer, and they paid me $50 for her. And would have paid me more if I'd been grown up instead of a kid. Well, anyway, $50 made me feel like I was Mrs. John D. Rockefeller. I should think so, said Mona. What about Greta? Oh, she was a mean sow. Big as a kitchen range, and my, my, was she mean. Perry couldn't have walked her to Verona, so he did the next best thing. He went to our neighbor, a farmer named Mr. Ruxin, who knew Greta well because she'd busted loose and eaten a whole row of onions in his garden once. He knew that she was a good sow, and he gave Perry a fine price for her. And after Perry sold the watch and the bike, and all we figured we were rich, <laughs> Miss Pearl began combing Mona's hair. So the next night, maybe 10 o'clock after our stepmother was asleep, we packed everything we owned, which wasn't much, into an old wicker suitcase of our father's. Perry looked at me. You ought to do something different with your hair, he says. Why, I says. Well, he says, you look too much like a kid. And anyway, for disguise, you ought to do something with it. Put it up or something. How old were you, asked Mona. 13, going on 14. And Perry, he was nearly 16. Well, but I couldn't put it up because we hadn't any pins. So Perry says, I know, we'll cut it off. We often kid about it now. He should have gone to the hairdressing business, I tell him, instead of me. He showed a real talent for it, I tell him. Honest, you should have seen me. He just took a pair of shears and cut off my hair like you'd cut off a bunch of grass with a sickle. <laughs> I was a sight. Perry says, well, you look worse, but you look older. So we sneaked out of the house. 
The only way to get down was by the front stairs, and Perry had a pair of new shoes that squeaked like puppies. The suitcase thumped against the banisters, and our hearts were right up where our tonsils were. Miss Pearl leaned out of the booth. Oh, Mr. Edward, she called. We're ready for you. Please go on, begged Mona. Okay, honey, said Miss Pearl. Do you want a manicure? Yes, I do, said Mona recklessly. I never had one in my life, and goodness, goodness knows when I'll ever have another chance. She shut Cuffy's disapproving face out of her mind. Just this once, she told herself. Miss Pearl went out of the booth and reappeared with a little table on wheels. She sat down at the table, snapped on a light, and reached out for Mona's hand, which she placed on a covered cushion. Mona stared with interest at the little bottles and the instruments on the table. <laughs> That's as far as we're going to get tonight. Um, I'm about halfway through and it's already been 20 minutes, so I hope you guys have enjoyed the story so far, and we will continue with the other half of chapter four next time. Thanks. Bye.